Welcome. My name is Mark Checklebane, and I'm the Community Relations Officer for the Berkeley Lab. And on behalf of everyone at the lab, I'd like to welcome you tonight to Berkeley Lab's Friend of Science Sponsor Talks, Science at the Theater. Did uh, everyone get this brochure when you came in tonight? I'm sure some of you probably didn't. This is a f Friend of Science brochure. Is anyone a member of Friend of Science? Is anyone a Friend of Science? Oh, good. Okay. Well, the Friend of Science uh, provides this form for individuals who share a passion for learning about science and technology. And I'd really like people to sign up tonight if you're interested in doing more forms or learning more about science and technology and the cutting edge things that are happening up at the lab. It's a free membership and there's more at the table when you come in or you can catch me after tonight. But now on with our program. First, logistics. The evening's talk will go till about 6.30 and then there'll be plenty of time, half an hour for questions. And uh, uh, the professor will be uh, asking the questions and if you could just you know, raise your hand just like you're at class and he'll call on you and he'll repeat your questions so everyone gets a chance to hear it. Can you hear me way in the back? We're good, okay, good. Second, I'd, I'd like to thank our many co-sponsors this evening. First, UC Berkeley, the Chabot Space and Science Center, the Exploratorium, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkeley, the Lawrence Hall of Science, and the science departments of the high schools at Albany, Berkeley, and Oakland. Finally, let me thank all of you for your interest in scientific research being done at the Berkeley Lab. As one of the world's premier research institutes, the Berkeley Lab researchers are seeking technical solutions to some of our greatest problems facing this city, the state, the world, and um, these problems include things like finding new sources for clean and sustainable energy, slowing global climate change, and finding cures for cancer and AIDS. And tonight's speaker is no different. Professor Arun Majumdar is just one of those researchers that is solving our world's problems. Professor Majumdar received a Bachelor of Technology in Mechanical Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay and a PhD here at Cal in mechanical engineering. While at Berkeley, Professor Majumdar conducted research in the laboratory of Professor and former Chancellor Chang Lin Tien. And Professor Majumdar joined the faculty at Cal after serving on the faculties at Arizona State and UC Santa Barbara. In addition to his faculty appointment, Professor Majumdar serves as the director of the Berkeley Nanosciences and Nano Engineering Institute. He's also on the editorial board of two journals. And he's a recipient of several awards and medals and is a member of numerous natural, national prestigious organizations. We're very lucky to have him speaking to us tonight. In his research interests he'll talk about tonight, he'll be talking about his leadership at the Berkeley Lab uh, of a team of scientists working to create a new generation of net zero energy carbon neutral buildings. Without further ado, welcome, Professor Ajumdar. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, you know, Berkeley is very close to me, as was pointed out. I was a graduate student here. I won't, you know, if I reveal the times, it was a long time ago. It will reveal my age as well. And I've been here 20 some odd years, so this is, um, this is very close to me. And um, it's also a very unique place. I don't think there is a um, university with the top national lab right next to it. I don't think there's a national lab with a top research university right next to it either. So that makes, I think, Berkeley very unique. And I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of you. Um, about a topic which I think um, I, don't, I don't have to um, motivate this crowd. I'm sure people are aware of the energy and environmental issues, but I will touch upon um, and motivate why you know, we need to think about buildings. Um, you know, we spend a lot of our times and hours of our day in buildings, and um, it is, as you will see, one of the big issues in terms of energy and the environment. But before I do that, I just want to sort of talk about the motivation of, you know, we are, we are in a point of history, which I believe is um, in many ways a turning point, a point of inflection, 
And I just want to spend a few minutes, or you know, maybe five or 10 minutes, just uh, capturing that in some way of that moment in history. So let me just uh, talk about, uh, you know, the, I think, in, in fact, the, the, the topic was decided on my behalf. Um, and the abstract was written as saying that the buildings are the SUVs, which is absolutely correct, but it's actually worse than that. Um, uh, and I'll touch upon that. So uh, buildings that think, I think before we can even go to green, I think let's say buildings that can even think. Um, I think there are some buildings and in, in people in, um, in New York, in, in Wall Street and, and Washington DC that are thinking red now. But, uh, but let's about, how about thinking green? So that's really the topic. And, um, and what I'll do before I go into it, I just want to capture that, that moment in history. So at the turn of the century, um, there were a lot of debates about, you know, what, is the most, what was the most important invention of the 20th century, OK? And that was a fair enough question. If you recall, this was about eight or nine years ago. Everyone was worried about Y2K. Remember that? <laughs> Y2K? Well, there were some people who said, OK, that's fine. But let's think about what happened in the last century and what was the most important invention. And if I take a poll, which I will not do, but if I take a poll, I think the answers would be something like, you know, aeroplanes, nuclear, space flight, computers, et cetera. Each one of them, if you cross that boundary, there was no looking back. The world had changed. And the answer was no, none of these. And that was caught, you know, I was reading, and this was this analysis, which is understandably debatable. But I, I was intrigued by this conclusion and I kept reading as to what was the most important invention. And, you know, the history goes back. Here's some history. The history goes back. In 1898, uh, Sir William Crookes, who was at that time the president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, called upon science and scientific community to save the world from impending starvation. And this was, in, of course, in Europe. And why? Because there was, the population was growing, and there was lack of nitrogen in the soil in Europe. And the bacteria and the biocatalyst were not quite sufficient to provide the nutrients in the soil. Okay? Seems very mundane, agriculture. But that was, those were the times. And they called upon science because otherwise there would be massive starvation and famine, uh, not only in Europe, but around the world. And in 10 years, a chemist by the name of Fritz Haber in Germany discovered a catalyst that would combine atmospheric nitrogen and hydrogen to form ammonia. And incidentally, that catalyst happened to be uranium in 1908. Isn't that interesting? And in 10 years, or sorry, in five years, 1913, Carl Bosch of BASF developed a process to mass produce ammonia and made fertilizers. Why was that considered more important than these things over here, aeroplanes, nuclear space flight, etc.? Right? Today in the day, age of internet, I asked this question in the electrical engineering computer science department, they said, oh, transistors, internet, okay? But that's not, not true. And that is because, because of this one invention between a, uh, and a partnership between a scientist and an engineer, the impact was that the fertilizer helped grow food and save the world from famine, and the world population grew from 1.6 billion people in 1900 to six billion people in 2000. And it had touched humanity that no other invention, any of these inventions, had actually touched. Because you would argue that many of these inventions don't touch the six billion people in the world, but food does. And of course, the Fritz and Haber you know, got there. There were several Nobel Prizes that came out of this and they, are, or they were recognized for that invention. And if you are interested, there are articles that came out in 1999 and 2001 called the 
the population explosion of the nitrogen bomb. And there are many implications of that. There are some bad implications of that because in 1914, you know what happened. Because that one in invention allowed them to grow, make fertilizers to grow food, but the same invention also allowed them to make explosives. And 1914 is when the First World War was started. And there are many implications thereafter as well. So this was the history. Why am I talking about this? Because it is the question of, you know, how can we touch, are we in a point in history that some of the things that we do would touch humanity in, that, in this way? And I think we are, because this energy and environment problem or issue is certainly one of those. Let me visualize this for you, or I'll, let me capture that in a visual. Here's the visual. This is the population density of the world. Okay, we are over here, okay, and that's that little dark spot out there. So dark is high density. You can see all the sparseness out here. You can see pockets, big cities, you know, Chicago out here, maybe you know, St. Louis out there, and of course, this corridor over here, New York to Boston, Washington DC, out here. And you know, then, then there's not much. This is Wasilla, Texas, I suppose. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, <laughs> let me not go there. But nevertheless, uh, um, you know, yeah, here, here's Europe. This is United Kingdom, you know, Germany, France, etc. And here is um, huge population densities in the Ganges Valley out here and around, around the coast, and in China and Japan, etc. Look at Australia; it's, it's essentially blanks except for Sydney, Brisbane, and um, and uh, Melbourne. And here's Africa, Nigeria, etc., with the large population densities, etc. Okay, and Latin America, um, South America out here. So that's that's where the population in the world lives. Okay, if you if you are to touch humanity, this is where the humanity really is. Okay, now let me show you, which tells you about the energy consumption in the world, the lighting pattern. Okay, which gives in a some aspect of where the energy is going, because it gives you, and this is obviously not on the same day, <laughs> it's been stitched together, but it gives you an idea. There's some really bright spots out here. It's really bright, and you know, we are over here, all right? And this Europe, you can see the coastlines, which are you know, fairly well populated, and then there's a lot of energy consumption. This is Nile, the River Nile, all right? And this goes back to ancient civilization. And here is India and China and Japan, etc. Here is uh, Europe, Eastern Europe out here. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, Australia, Nigeria, Africa, and Latin America out here. Now, let me overlay those two pictures and you'll get the message. This is the overlaid part, which gives you sort of the mismatch between, uh, between people and where energy is consumed. Okay? So here you have. People, surely people, but this, this is really bright, all right? And you have regions out here where there's, you know, these red spots, the, the population density is high, but it's essentially, there's not much energy consumed. And look at this out here, you know, there's a lot of population and, you know, it's not that bright out here. The point is that if in these regions, the GDP is going up, people are earning more, and if they start turning on the lights, we have a real problem in our hands. The question, the challenge that we have for our and the next few generations is that how do we dim the lights over here without changing, okay, without drastically changing our lifestyle? We have to maybe change a little bit. And how can we enable them to turn on the right lights and improve their quality of life? Now that's a big challenge. People call it a Manhattan Project, but in, in fact, many of the things that happened in Berkeley, you know, Manhattan Project had a lot to, uh, Berkeley had a lot to do with the Manhattan Project. This is a bigger problem than Manhattan Project. Because here you have economics. Here it touches humanity like no other things except for the Haber-Bosch process. And the reality is such that things are so bad or we can get into such a train wreck that if we don't innovate like no other time in history, we are going to 
hit this train wreck. Let me explain. Let me give you the actual data. So this is the energy supply and demand in the United States, just as an example. Um, here is where the energy, this is called primary energy, petroleum, natural gas. These numbers are in quads. Okay, quads is one quad is one quadrillion BTU, or one quad is approximately 10 raised to 18 joules of energy, all right? So the primary energy, the total primary energy of the United States is approximately 100 quads. So, you know, remember the number 100. And so petroleum is 40, natural gas is 22, coal is 22, nuclear is 8, solar, 0 0.006. Right? And if solar even has to come to six in the next 25 years, that industry has to grow at 25, or sorry, at 30 to 35 percent per year for the next 25 years. Okay? And so things like the financing schemes in Berkeley that are enabling solar are really innovative in many different ways. That's just a policy, but the technology has to improve. But nevertheless, this is the supply side out here. And you can look at the renewables. You know, this is 2.7, 2.78. These are the majority of the renewables today. And here is geothermal, wind, solar, and nuclear. And this is where the carbon fossil fuels are. And where does this energy go? Well, it, here is the demand, okay? And it's roughly in three sectors almost equal. It's in buildings, residential and commercial, industrial, and transportation. Almost one-third, one-third, one-third. So this is what I call a two-headed snake, okay? If you only work on renewables, the demand is going to kill you. If you only work on reducing the demand, this is going to kill you. So let me explain. So, you know, there are many issues about energy that we talk about today, and I'm just going to quickly walk, walk through. Availability of fossil fuels. So there are some myths about, oh, we are the, in peak oil, et cetera. Let me just walk you through that. Availability of fossil fuel, energy security, and, these, and this language is used in the elections and in the media, et cetera. Uh, are we running out of fuel? Economics, the price of oil, you know, price of gasoline is certainly an issue. CO2 emissions and global warming, of course, climate change is a big issue. These, the top three, the, the, the first three topics were there in the 1970s energy crisis, and somehow it went away because the price of oil came down, because supply went up, and boom. That, that thing went away, and I'll show you what I mean by that in actual data. This is a new one. The question is, which ones, which of these are the most important ones? Well, let's take the first one. This is the price of oil, okay, in $2,004. This is the availability. So this 1,000 billion barrels, or 1 trillion barrel, has already been produced. And if the price of oil was $20 a barrel, then you would hit a wall, that means you have another thousand, and then you would hit a wall. And then we are certainly at the peak of, of oil. But if the price is what it is today, today the, actually the price of oil went up by $20 a barrel, today. Okay? So if it is over here somewhere, all this is available. Okay? And some of this is available after you include CO2 mitigation. Okay, that means you can capture the CO2 and reduce the CO2 emissions. So this, essentially the point is that the peak is shifting, and it's shifting with the price of oil. Okay? So to say that we don't have, we're not going to have oil in the next 50 years or next 60 years is a, is a myth. Because if, you, if the price is high enough, you can invest more and go deeper um, and get more oil. Even if you run out of oil, there is coal. So this is the oil reserves. This is Middle East, okay, in oil reserves. This is Europe and Eurasia, Africa. Here is Asia, which is the biggest growth in economy, is in Asia. And that's got the smallest reserves of oil. And this is coal. This is Asia, Europe, um, and North America, Africa, etc. And so, and if you look at where, which countries the coal is there, you find that USA, Russia, China, and India have the fourth or four largest reserves of coal. So if you run out of oil, you're going to move to coal. And any fossil fuel 
coal can be transformed into oil, you know, liquid fuel at any time. That technology was developed in the Second World War. It's called Fischer-Tropsch process. Of course, the, the challenge is how to reduce the CO2 emissions based on that. And the coal in the United States, you know, we have about, you know, arguably about 150 to 200 years of coal. China is about 100 to 150. India is about 100 to 150 years of coal. So for the next 100 years, let's say, there's enough coal out there. And if there's enough coal, there will be enough oil because you can always change from one to the other. Okay. To say that we have, we don't, we have, we have an energy crisis is a myth because there's enough fossil fuel. That's not the issue. Economics is certainly the issue, but the economics can change if you increase the supply and, 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 and you can bring the price down, which is exactly what happened in 19, early 1980s. And then the whole energy crisis went away. So you know where I'm going with this. Well, here is the actual demand increase. So this is the population of the world. Okay? And here is today, we are at about 6.5 billion people. And this is going to be uh, going to sort of saturate at about 12 billion, 12 billion people in the world in about 100 years or so, okay? based on all calculations of the United, States, uh, United Nations. This is GDP per capita. That means that is going up, which is good, which is in the right direction. We are producing more uh, per person. And that is in the right, the vector is in the right direction. This is watts per GDP, the amount of power that you use per unit of GDP. And that is going down. That means we are becoming more energy efficient, which is also in the right direction. And here's the carbon per joule. That is, how much carbon do you emit, carbon dioxide do you emit, per joule of energy that you consume. And that is going down. So everything is in the right direction except for one. So if you take the product of the first three, it's the total power we consume. And if you take the product of all four, you get the total carbon emission rate. And this is what you get. This is the total power, which is increasing linearly. And ignore the colors for the time being. And today, we use about 15 terawatts of power around the world. And this is the carbon emission rate. Today, we emit about 8 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. And that is increasing linearly. What that, so let me spend a little bit of time explaining what that is. This means that the demand is increasing, but the renewable part of the supply cannot keep up. And so this is the gap. And the gap is increasing linearly. So the, another way of saying is, is the following. So let's say my salary is you know, $1,000 a month. Okay. My salary is $1,000, and it sort of remains that way. And I start consuming. So, you know, this year I take one vacation a year. Next year I take three vacations a year. And the year after that I take five vacations a year. And sooner or later I'll be taking a vacation every day. Okay? So let's, let's say I do that. So what happens then? Then my spending or my consumption goes up. You know, let's say it goes up linearly, and my salary remains the same. So where do you think that gap goes? It goes on the credit card bill, right? That's the gap. I can't just keep up. My salary is increasing at like 3% or 4% a year, and my consumption just keeps on going up. And I charge everything to the credit card bill, to the credit card, and the rate of increase of the credit card increases linearly. So the gap increases linearly on time, with time. And I have a deficit like nobody's business. That's the deficit that we're keeping for our kids and our grandkids. Okay, we talk about a financial deficit, here's a carbon deficit. So the rate is increasing linearly with time. And this carbon dioxide goes up in the atmosphere and just sort of stays there for a few hundred years before it drifts and goes into the oceans. And the oceans are the biggest sinks of our carbon dioxide. All right? So what happens is that if this thing is just going up linearly in time, it just accumulates. And so as a result, the carbon dioxide goes up ex in a sort of quadratically in our best approximation, probably even worse, because there's some positive feedbacks. So today, we are at about 380 parts per million of CO2. And in 50 years, We'll be at 
double the pre-industrial level and with some very severe consequences that we can, you know, we, we, can, we can see coming. And the challenge of our times is how do we turn this around? And it has to be turned around by looking at both the supply and the demand. You cannot look at only one. Okay, so either or we have to reduce the number of vacations and increase our paycheck. Because you can't just, you know, you can't reduce that one, one and then expect the others to, um, the other one will kill you. So let me, so here is, uh, you, you have seen this picture, if your carbon dioxide goes up, the global temperature goes up, and you know, this is an Al Gore's movie, et cetera. Um, here, is, here is actual data of the polar ice caps. Um, this is the square, millions of square miles um, in year, okay? This is uh, 1985, 1990, and it sort of fluctuates a little bit, and sort of there's a trend going down, okay? And here is 2005, to this previous record, this is 2007. Okay, so we are seeing an acceleration in how it is happening, and this is not predicted. This is worse than what is predicted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate, Climate Change, IPCC. And so we are seeing some acceleration because of some positive feedback into the system, and so this is just a repeat of the same thing. And actually this year, it is apparently even worse. So just to give you an idea, this is, I'm using the analogy that Steve Chu, the lab director, uses, is that we are on the Titanic, literally. We are on the Titanic, the icebergs are breaking. They're coming at us, okay? And it takes about, the, the iceberg is about two miles away, and it takes about three miles to turn the ship around. And some people are saying, Oh, forget about it. there's no iceberg. And some people are just reshuffling the deck chairs. Okay? That's literally what's happening. And we're going to hit this iceberg. And there is no captain of the ship. <laughs> All right? And here is an example that there is no captain of the ship. This is federal R&D budget in the, on various sectors. This is defense. All right? This is space. You can see the moonshot. 1960s, how that went up. Um, this is health, and you see the increase during the Clinton years. And this is energy. And you see this little bump out here? That was the first energy crisis, and it went down in 1980s, 82, early 80s. And it has remained essentially flat, okay? And so, you know, <laughs> and what this has to do now is to have an acceleration like this budget over here to really innovate in science, engineering, policy, market transformation. Because this has to be adopted by the markets because otherwise it'll never fly. So we ought to enter into a time of major innovations. I'm talking about the transistor, the laser, the integrated circuits, the internet, and the Haber-Bosch process all happening simultaneously in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Otherwise, we're not going to turn the ship around, and it is going to hit the iceberg head on, if not sideways. So that is what we require. We have to have innovations in all three, science and engineering, technology, and policy. Okay? So that's, that's sort of the background message I wanted to say before I get into the buildings and why we need to look at buildings. So again, talking about the supply and demand curve, this is, this is where my paycheck is. This is my credit card, and we can't keep on increasing the credit card. So we either reduce this and increase this, not or, not either. We have to reduce this and increase these, this so that we can reduce that. That's the equation, it's very simple in many ways. Of course, to enact it is not that easy. There's inertia in the system. So, what do we do? So, McKenzie, the consulting company, did some very interesting work, which is not completely accurate. There's some issues with it, but it just gives a general idea. And here's what is called the carbon abatement curve. This is cost of carbon, euros and tons of CO2, and this is the amount of carbon that you can per year 
And this is what, you'd, what you would get by 2030. And the point is that you have various options. You have insulation improvements in buildings, you get fuel efficient commercial vehicles, air conditioning, lighting system, et cetera. And you get you know, forestation, you get wind, you get solar, et cetera. What this says is that if there's anything negative, that is the low hanging fruit. Okay? Think of this as the low hanging fruit. And it has been, in, it has been categorized in three categories. One is the use, which is the consumption or the demand. The other is the production and distribution, that is the generation, that's the supply side. And this is the management, okay? So soil, forestation, et cetera. And while we can tinker with the numbers and there are some issues with the calculations, I think the, the obvious fact is that the lowest hanging fruit is to reduce the demand of energy. We are extremely wasteful. Okay? So when the abstract said that you know, the buildings are the SUVs, as, as I will point out, it's not just the, that buildings are the SUVs of, of well, the building industry. They are SUVs where the SUV is being driven with the brakes on. Okay? It's that bad. And I'll give you some examples of that. So, so buildings matter. Why? Because buildings use 72% of the nation's electricity and 55% of its natural gas. 72, 70% of the electricity goes into buildings, buildings like this, all right? So if you look at the demand side, you got about 40%, and this is the United States, 40% goes into buildings, 32% goes into industry, and 28% in transportation. So this is actually a bigger sector than any of the other two, but let's say roughly one third. If you look at the industry and ask the question, where does the energy go in the industry? The biggest energy hogs are, guess what? Cement, steel, glass, aluminum, paper, which go into buildings and transportation. So we come back, if you look at the buildings holistically, this is much more than 40%. And it's roughly split into half an hour between residential and commercial. And also building sector is 9.5%, almost 10% of the US GDP. It employs 8 million people, and the building's utility bill is about $370 billion per year. That's a $400 billion per year. And if you look at where the energy goes, you have, let's say, let's say commercial buildings, you got lighting is 26%, uh, heating is 14 cooling is 13 water heating, and you can go in, in residential buildings, you got 31% of heating, water heating is 12%, et cetera. If you do a quick analysis, quick number crunching, you'll find that heating and cooling, just purely heating and cooling, is about 40% out here and 60% over there. So if you can manage heat properly, it's a big deal. So while these are taking one small slice, this is what is happening today. Of course, these are all interacting, and I'll come to that, which is where the smartness comes in. So if we do not address this aspect of the demand side, it is unlikely that we're going to get to changing the ship and turning the ship around. That's the point. It is extremely important that we do this, and we do transportation, and we do industrial, all simultaneously, and we look at renewables. And that's why I said we need innovation like we have never had this before in the energy sector. Okay, you need transistors, equivalent of transistors, lasers, and all, going all simultaneously and feeding off each other. So. What we are now launching is a, one of those sort of aggressive, innovative research centers called High Performance Buildings Research and Implementation Center, or Hyperbrick, which is a collaboration between national labs, not just DOE, uh, not just LBL, but NREL in uh, Colorado, uh, Oak Ridge, PNNL, et cetera. Um, Industrial consortium, and as, as you will see, you know, industry plays a big role. We have to partner with industry. And universities, we are next to Berkeley campus, and there are other universities that are involved in this sector. Um, if you look at this area, you have to address three issues. It, it cannot be just a technology push. In fact, since the 19, early 80s, there's been a lot of technology that has been developed but it got, never got implemented because we did not have 
the right markets. And the right markets were not there because we did not have the right policies. So you have to innovate in all three. It cannot be a technology push, it has to be a market pull. And I'll briefly mention that as well. So what is it that we need to do? So the vision is the following. That we want to enable the transformation of the US commercial buildings industry in the next 20 years. And we give a timeline of 20 years. And if we, can, we have to reduce the energy consumption in buildings, at least commercial buildings, by 80% in new buildings, which is often called the zero net energy buildings, because that 20% comes from renewables, making it carbon neutral. And at least 50% in retrofits, that means in existing buildings. And for the United States, this is very important because we don't build as many new buildings out here um, as other countries. And of course, you can, you can reduce the energy consumption very easily by turning off all the lights. But that's not what we are really talking about. We want to enhance the health and the comfort, safety and security, and water usage. So that's sort of our vision. If we can do this, this is, a, as, a, as you will see, this is a non-trivial task. And it's non-trivial because we have to relate it to the market. You know, th these things cost a lot of money. So if we could do that somehow, what would it do? So this is the energy consumption in buildings, in commercial buildings in this case, the increase in energy consumption, of the projected increase over the years based on the square footage increase in commercial buildings. And if we could reach these goals by 2030, let's say, you would have saved this much of energy. This is in quads, about you know, seven quads um, or four quads out here. That's the amount of saving that we'll have. What does that really mean? Well, here it is. Put these numbers in comparison, the demand and the supply side. This is the amount of energy savings. That's this blank out here. That's in 2030, but compare it just for scale the amount of electricity that, people, that we generate in the United States from coal-fired power plants. So what that means is that if we, can, if we can save this much of energy, essentially, we can turn off half the coal-fired power plants in this country. That's the implication. And this is in our hands. We just have to develop, innovate, and implement. We don't have to find a new source of energy. We don't have to import oil or import coal. This is in our hand because these buildings exist over here. And if, you, if this part of energy that you actually use matches up with the nuclear oil renewables out here, then we have essentially carbon, made this carbon neutral. Just for comparison, I put Three Gorges Dam in China, which had a big environmental, you know, there was a lot of discussion about whether we should have it or not. That's the amount of power of energy per year that you will generate from Three Gorges Dam. So what this says is that if you can reduce the energy consumption like this, you will not have to build those power plants that are in the planning stages right now, if you could just save that energy by energy efficiency. This is the growth rate in the United States. It grows at about 1.7% a year. This is China at 7% a year. And today, they have more square footage in commercial buildings than the United States. This is India, 8.5% per year. That's where the new buildings are happening. And they are calling us almost on a daily to weekly basis, how can we design our buildings well? Because the reality in India, this is I know because you know, of my heritage, I know this. The supply cannot meet the demand, so you have power cuts. And power cuts are bad for business. This is affecting hurting business. And so the business people, the IT companies in India are saying that help us reduce the energy consumption in our buildings so that we can actually do our business better. So people are becoming green because of economic reasons, which is exactly what it should be. Because if you don't have the economics behind you, it's hard to actually you know, make it implemented in, in the market. So that's where the new buildings are really happening, and here's some existing buildings out here. But if we can get to this level around the world, we have really changed the way things are done. The question is, how do we get there? This is a non-trivial task. So 
Let me give you the current status of how bad the situation really is. If you designed a building, let's say you designed this building or you know, the power bar building, for example. You can design the building, for example, you know, the insulation, the uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, the lighting, etc. And this is what is called the design performance. You can, you can say, you know, by the way, most of the buildings th uh, today are designed for comfort and for looks. Okay? They're not designed for energy. All right? This is the design performance. So you design it, let's say, and then say, okay, this building is going to actually consume this much of energy per year. And this is the actual performance. In an ideal case, this should be a straight line with maybe about, you know, if you're, if you're a scientist, you'll say, okay, about 10 or 20% scatter around the data. This is what the reality is. Okay? It's all over the place. So when we say, I'm going to design a zero net energy building, okay, I'll take the design performance out here, but in reality, I could be over there. This is not a myth. Here is some data. Okay? Here is some data. These are lead buildings. Lead, if you, I don't know if you know, lead is leadership in energy and environmental design. These are the best, supposedly the best buildings out there. You get a lead gold rating, lead platinum rating. These are low energy consuming, etc. But these are all for design performance. And when you actually go and measure the performance, this is what you see. This is the design value. This is what happens in reality. Okay? This is gold platinum, this is silver, this is certified, etc. And if the design value, oops, if the design value is out here, the, the more you squeeze to lower and lower energy consuming buildings, the more you are from reality. This is the actual over design. And guess what? All the building codes, like Title 24 in California, are all based on design codes, not measured performance. That's the reality. Okay? Obvious thing is that can we turn this around and, and value or, or build codes not for design performance but on the actual performance so that you actually get your electricity bill and so you have consumed this much and if your electricity, you know, if you consume more than your design, a standard, you got to pay higher. And if you can do better than the standard, you get some financial incentives. That has not happened yet. We are still stuck over here. This is reality, okay? This is part of the reality. There's other issues with this. The other issues is that, so what is the problem? The problem is the following. If you I plot this on depth versus breadth, how widely can a technology be deployed, which is breadth, and how deep are the energy cuts, okay? So there are today, there are, you know, technologies, a company called ESCOs, energy saving, energy service companies, which can do some incremental change. They can, they can tighten some, you know, uh, tighten some standards, tune up some retrofits programs. They can, you know, fix the valve out here, change the, 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 you know, the glass in your windows, etc. This, I call, is equivalent to the tune-up of your car. Okay, so you take your car and you get it tuned up and you make it a little more energy efficient, and you get about 10, 15%, maybe 20% energy efficiency in your car. You need a regular tune-up. But you do not make a car which runs at 300 miles per gallon, can you? Well, you could make a car which runs at 300 miles per gallon, you can make buildings which is zero energy, but they cost you about $500,000, okay, in a car. Okay, you can buy a Tesla today, wow. It's plug-in hybrid, and it's got a large battery, it'll cost you $100,000. The question, the challenge is, how do you make deep energy cuts and widely deployed? That is the challenge. All right? And that is a non-trivial task. You have to look at a building as a whole. Okay, you cannot take the HVAC and make it more and more efficient. I use the analogy of cars because it is easy to understand. So today what people are doing are making very efficient energy efficiency uh, heating and air conditioning system, efficient lighting, et cetera. But what happens is that you can make the components of the system very, very efficient, but the system just falls apart. Let me give you an example. 
If you have a very efficient engine in your car, and you've got a very efficient brake, and you run with your brakes on, as I mentioned before, you very efficiently waste energy. <laughs> okay, very efficiently. And that's exactly, in many cases, that's what is happening. The building is fighting itself instead of cooperating. What is example of cooperation is a hybrid car, where you take the energy from your brakes, store it in a battery, use it to run the car, and the system then, everything is the same except for the integration of the system. The system performs much better than each individual component put, to, put individually. And so that is what is really required in buildings. That's one of the aspects. So let me sort of give you, this is how, by the way, there's a, there's a, that's the, the technical aspect. This is the process of how buildings are built today. Buildings are built by a conceptual design, let's say by a building owner. I say, I want to build the best building with all glass facades and all that. And it should look like the modern Taj Mahal. All right, that's great. But I have this budget. <laughs> and I have to build this in this budget. Okay, so that's the conceptual design. Then the engineers and architects sort of go and say, okay, let me see. That's a sort of detailed design. And then it goes to construction, the contractor, the general contractor. And the general contractor gives, gives it to the mechanical contractor, the electrical contractor, et cetera, and goes into its own silos. And every time this happens, it's like Chinese whisper, things get changed. And by the time a, a building is actually built, it can be quite different from how it was designed. And no one ever checks because the performance is never measured. So this is the only, I mean, it's, it's sorry to say this, but this is the only industry where a product is made and delivered without ever testing it. And that's where it is. What you really want is something like this, the building value chain, where you have a conceptual design, you do a detailed design, and then you iterate. You build the operation in the design process itself, and you iterate. It's like building the Boeing 777. In a Boeing 777, when it's built, when Boeing builds it, it's done virtually, all right? So if the aerodynamics, if the, if the wing shape changes, the structural engineer gets to know about it. The power guys get to know about it. The avionics get to know about it. So if you do a little tweak, the whole system feels it. And then you can do a system optimization. That is what is required in an iterative way so that the whole community, the process can be really integrated. These tools do not exist today. And that's part of the reason of coming up with this sort of aggressive you know, innovation in, in Hyperbrick is to come up with, change the process of building. And this, as you can imagine, is a very conservative business because they're putting billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars in building a building. So uh, this has to change. The process has to change. The second thing I would say, and by the way, there's some element of that that has gone on in LBL. This is the, the federal, San Francisco Federal Building, which was designed in some elements of that where in a, in a place like San Francisco, to use an air conditioning system is, just doesn't make sense. You have the best air conditioner right next to you, which is the ocean. And so this uses natural ventilation okay, to, to develop it. I mean, I'll give you an example. This is an LBL, the new computational building. Okay? It's, it's being designed and it's going to be built. And it has about, what, 10 megawatts going into the building for computation. Okay? And the designer, the architect, wanted to put a heater on the building, which absolutely doesn't make sense because all this comp computing, this, this 10 megawatts is going into, it's essentially generating heat. So why can't that heat be used? Because buildings are built with heaters and air conditioners, et cetera. So that process has to change. Um, so in a building, if you look at the, the way it is done today, you have you know, windows and lighting, you have heating, ventilation, air conditioning, you have appliances, you have building materials, like building walls and insulation, you have on-site power, sometimes you may have a little micro turbine, and you may have thermal and electrical storage, you have natural ventilation, indoor, and today, the market is such that everything runs independently. You have you know, Philips and GE making, making lighting, you have uh, carrier and train making air conditioning, uh, you have Dow making building materials. You've got you know, other companies making power generators. Uh, appliances, there are many appliances, refrigerators, et cetera. They're different companies. 
So they're not talking to each other. All right? They're vastly different company. There is no system integrator, like in the defense industry. There is none like that. And they never talk to each other, except when they put in a building. And the building, they put all these things, and they work independently. And as I said, they're fighting each other often. And so unless we start putting, thinking of this as a holistic system and make them cooperate, use the heat from here for heating out, he out there. So these guys should talk to each other. The windows and lighting should talk to HVAC. And the building materials should talk to HVAC as well. The industry is not quite set up for that. And so that's a process change that needs to happen. So this is the sort of what is often now called the whole building systems approach. Um, just to give you an idea, there are some elements of that which is happening. This is now in LBL, the Windows Testing Lab. So you have different electrochromic windows which tune automatically what, how much light comes in. But it's not just windows. You know, windows are often thought of, of you know, or, or as a light, you know, you let's light in. And if you, if you can, you know, if you have a lot of sunlight, you don't need to turn on your, your lighting electrical lighting, which is good. You consume less energy. But along with the sunlight comes radiant load, which turns out, which heats up and increases the HVAC load. Well, maybe you can put some shades in front of the windows or reduce the transmission like in these electrochromic windows. Well, if that's the case, well, you reduce the HVAC load then, but you need to turn on the lights. So is there some way to optimize it so that you get enough light, okay, and you reduce the HVAC load? Well, those are the kinds of things that have not really been figured out. And here is a, is a facility which has HVAC and which has these windows and is, looks at the interaction between the two components where the industry never talks to each other. And a national lab is exactly the place where you can put all these things together and see what happens. Um, this is another switchable electrochromic windows. You can see the uh, different windows out here. And this was, went into, and there's a, there's an existent proof of how this can change the way things are done. This is the New York Times building in Manhattan. All right? And in New York Times, they wanted to say, that, OK, we want to you know, design a new building where we reduce the energy consumption. And they came to LBL and they came to UC Berkeley and said, what can you do? We have heard about some of the things that you guys do. And so what they did was they built a mock-up facility to try out these things. So here is an example. Here is lighting. Here are the windows where sunlight comes in. And look at the, these are fluorescent lamps. And if you're close to the window, you don't need to turn on the fluorescent lamps. There's enough lighting. But then you to keep turning on because the light, amount of light that goes through is less. So these are dimmable, addressable, affordable. And a mock-up facility like this helps you, you know, vet these things and see whether they actually work or not. And then you can implement it in a large in a sort of um, in a building out here. And there's a lot of simulation and modeling that goes on into developing systems like this. So this is an example. I, I, I think, I mean, I call it just a start of how an, you know, this kind of thing can actually change the way things are done in a one building. One building, though. That's why I call it just a start. It has to happen in the five million commercial buildings that are there today in the United States and many more around the world. How do we do that? That needs some aggressive you know, science, innovation, engineering policy changes. There are other examples, and I think Mary Ann Piet um, uh, gave a talk in this forum out here of demand response. So when the, the temperature goes up, and the, the, you know, when it becomes really hot, the HVAC load, the air conditioning load goes up, and that peak power is very expensive. So this is a demand response looking at the buildings and looking at the supply, so you've got a supply demand. PG&E is a supplier of electricity, and the buildings are, are consumers. So can you use modern information technology, or the internet, to, for them to talk to each other, except only electricity going one way? Can you actually control, saying that if you can just change the thermostat a little bit, you, can, you may not have to turn on the other turbine, which really is expensive. And so this is a demand response research center. I won't go into the details, and there's some data on uh, how much energy that can be saved. It's in the order of megawatts. So coming back to this, of how do you make this 
talk to each other. And what you really need, and what is now being developed, is like the operating system of a computer. We call it the building operating platform, a building operating system. So it's the smart operator. So if you, if you want to have these talk, whoops, you have to have information from what, this, what is the HVAC load, what is the on-site power, the appliances, et cetera, how much lighting is coming in, and have some intelligence in being able to have these components cooperate with each other. That does not exist today. Okay, so the brain behind the building does not exist. So think of an operating system, Unix, or dare I say Windows. Okay, what does it do? It coordinates the activity of your computer. You got some programs running out here, some PowerPoint, some Word, and there's some networking going on. It, all, it coordinates and have, have them talk to each other. That Unix of the buildings does not exist. And that is something that has to happen to be able to coordinate. And there's a science behind how you design and make them cooperate as opposed to fight each other. So that is something that you know, needs to be done. The sensors, communication, controls, optimization, energy use. Let me walk you through an example. And this is getting a little technical, but let me walk you through an example. If you have a building, you have some dynamic information, occupancy. If, you, if there are no people in a building or in a room, you don't need to turn on the lights, right? So you have occupancy, you've got temperature, you've got humidity, air quality, lights, appliances. These are dynamic. And some static info, architecture, flow plan, orientation. You need to take this information through some network. I mean, this is all exists today. It just hasn't been integrated. In a network communication, you have some architecture in some design, and this has to sit in something called a building operating platform. And what does it do? Well, this exists, but the brain really does not exist, the intelligence. So what it needs to do is to decide what kind of heating and air conditioning should I use? I have many options. I can have a central air conditioning. I can use waste heat. I could use the thermal energy that I'd stored from the night before or from the day before, or I could use external ventilation like in San Francisco. Okay? And so which one should I turn on has to be decided because of a goal of minimizing the carbon footprint. Then I can have some plug loads. Okay, so here are all the appliances. Some of the computers are turned on when they should not be turned on. No one's around. They should be turned off, the printers and the computers. Um, there's lighting, the many options in lighting. You have windows, you have facades and shades, you have electrical lighting. Which one and how much of that should I be turning on? And then you have weather. You know, if it's going to be a hot day tomorrow, and I know it today, can I plan for it? Can I cool down tonight, all right, and store that energy somewhere so that I can use it instead of turning on the HVAC? Uh, there is the carbon emission rates. There's going to be a price of carbon in the future. There is electric utility bills. Uh, you could store the electricity so that when the, when the electricity price is low, I store it, and I use it later on. Or I could have on-site power. If I have on-site power, there's a heat that comes out of the on-site power that I could use for waste heat. So I can start coordinating. And all this, of course, has to then, you know, has to make it a zero energy or minimize the cost or visualize. You know, people don't even know, right? And I just get a utility bill and this meter that goes round and round at homes. Well, that's, that's what I get. I can't visualize where the energy is going. And that is one of the biggest problems in these buildings. So that is what we are thinking in terms of the intelligence of a building. And parts of this have already been developed. The demand response side certainly has been developed. But other parts, this is, we have now the sort of the rudimentary form of the Unix platform, the Unix for buildings, or I should say the Linux, because we wanted to make it available to everyone. So in terms of smart buildings, there are some major innovations in science and engineering that are required. This monitoring and diagnostic, self-tuning. Can the buildings commission itself? All right. Building design and operating platform, I just talked about it. Um, Game-changing innovations. This is absolutely key. Game-changing innovations in heating and cooling. That's about 50 to 60% of the load. Building materials, thermal electrical storage. Storage comes up every time because the demand and supply vary so much. If you can just store, you can impedance match the supply and the demand over time and the lighting. The policy, very, very important to have all of them coordinated. 
policy. Building standards based on measured performance, not on design performance. And that is absolutely, you know, it has to happen. Otherwise, we'll, we'll get this mismatch between design and, and actual performance. And what you really have to do is to, and this has to be market driven, financial incentives and disincentives, carrots and sticks in plain words, for energy saving with respect to standards that can be shared by designer, builder, user. This is what is called a split incentive problem. Because the builder puts the HVAC system, okay, and maybe pays the utility bill, but the user is the tenant in the building, which uses it, doesn't have to worry, and doesn't design the HVAC system. So if you provide the financial incentives, the builder may take all of it and can, can never share. So why is the tenant even incentivized to save energy? This is called a classic sp split incentive problem or principal agent problem. Okay? That needs to be addressed by a policy. Um, then, of course, demonstration and technology testbed. No one believes that you can get to zero net energy buildings. Okay, no one, can, no one believes that. So reconfigure, I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly. We should be retrofitting all existing UC buildings and reducing the energy consumption. And this is something that we'll be talking to UCOP, the Office of the President. And we, have been, we just had one conversation with Google. And said, could you put the energy consumption of federal, state, and university buildings on Google Maps? We don't know how much my building in LBL or campus and you know, the building in San Francisco, how much they're consuming. And unless you know, you never know how bad or how good you are. And when you put them, it's that transparency allows you to see, boy, I'm really doing badly. I should be doing something about it. And it's sort of a behavior change that could potentially happen. Behavior, human factor is very important. All right? If you can build, you say, okay, let's get this building competing with that building to reduce energy consumption. And at the end of the day, you might get some carrots, financial incentives to do that. Wouldn't that be nice? So that kind of transparency based on actual real performance is very critical. And so talking about you know, not believing, when we say that we should be getting to an energy building because you're otherwise using a natural resource that belongs to everyone, builders and owners don't quite believe it. So what we are now proposing is to have a fully instrumented, reconfigurable building. That means you, you have, you know, you just have the framework, you put your building materials, you put your envelope structure, HVAC, lighting, windows, these companies don't talk to each other, let's put that all together and see how it works. In sort of the test drive. We need to test drive and see whether that operating system that we talked about actually works before we actually deploy it, otherwise no one's gonna believe it. And then have these guys actually see Get the whole community together, talking to each other, and see whether this actually can reduce the building and make them believe it, and then deploy it later on. So um, this, of course, um, has to be done not, done not just in the United States, but in those two areas that I talked about, China and India, where they're the biggest growth rates in the economy and the biggest carbon emitter and consumers. So we have a China program which started in 1988, 20 years ago, by Mark Levine, the former director of the division, which looks at buildings, energy efficiency, industrial, et cetera, and the policies. And China is, is incidentally quite aggressive about this, in reducing energy consumption in buildings. Um, we're just launching the India program, okay, which is Berkeley India Joint Leadership on Energy and Environment, looking at policy and market transformation, technology development, and science and engineering, all feeding off each other. Okay, Bijli, by the way, in India is electricity. Uh, it's also lightning. So we hope this will strike lightning somewhere and in the innovations in all three. And it's really the interaction of all three that is important. So um, let me stop uh, by putting this picture back again. And you know, I, I talk about the iceberg hitting or you know, the Titanic. When that happens, if you recall you know, what happened in Titanic, the first people to get affected really badly are the people in the, in the third class, right? They got dumped in the water first. And that's what will happen. I mean, the people living out here in this delta, okay, in Bangladesh, there are already events happening where the water level rises and they have their refugee camps already out there. And it's gonna happen all along the coastlines out here. And uh, obviously, you know, the question is how do we avert that while still maintaining the economic growth? 
And we are really, as I said, on the Titanic. And unless we do something quickly, it'll be hard to avert it. So let me stop here, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions. And I think I was supposed to put up this part. In, uh, so thank you very much again. Yeah. Yes, sir. I think one of the, the most important things that I take away from today is the whole notion of the feedback loop, whether it's in, in terms of a building or in terms of how you go about looking at what you're doing. And I think that one of the important variables here is the human variable. And you have sort of taken care of that in terms of carrots and sticks and the market and so on. That's rational behavior. But there are, <laughs> One is irrational behavior, and, and you, you know, all aware of irrational behavior, but the other is non-rational behavior. Behavior that's based upon aesthetics, or ethics, or cultural practices, and so on. And especially as you look into other cultures, like India and China, that have very firm cultural practices, the integration of those cultural practices, what's going on in, in terms of people's heads and how they view the world, it seems to me is as important as anything you do in the energy field. So I, I, would, I would really urge that perhaps a sociologist, an anthropologist, I happen to be afflicted with sociology, so <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I mean, this is what I presented is a very sort of technical viewpoint. Um, I can tell you what's happening in India right now. There are a lot of buildings that are new buildings that are being built, and they're being built based on European design. And as you know, the, the, the weather in Europe and India are quite different. <laughs> and so they're building all glass facades. Um, and beautiful looking buildings where if you look back in the history of India and in, you know, those, those regions, the buildings were built with high ceilings so that you have thermal stratification. And you know, I, I went to a boarding school in the middle of the desert, okay? And it was you know, 40, 45 degrees Celsius temperatures outside. And the buildings were built in such a way that we did not need air conditioning. Not that we did not want air conditioning, <laughs> you know. We, sometimes we did want, but it's it just that it was designed in a way that we need not have. We could, we, could, we could go, you know, get by without it. And that's the kind of thing that has to be, you're absolutely right, and how do we take it, um, uh, how do we take the local, the social issues and, and the culture and integrate that into buildings because there is an aesthetic aspect of it. There is a cultural aspect to architecture and how do we integrate that into and, and still make it energy efficient. I mean, that's the real challenge and I, I couldn't agree more with what you said. Yes, ma'am. Are you aware of any policymakers who have addressed the issue of the split incentives? For example, in Berkeley, there is a high percentage of rented properties and that is the residential yeah. The, the problem has been around for a while. I mean, people know about this problem, and uh, there may be some policy wonks out here that I, I'm not a policy person. That's my, not my background. But I've asked the question, has anyone solved the split incentive problem for the building side? And I haven't gotten a straight answer, to be honest. Um, and whether you need technology to solve it, some of it is true. Um, but there are other aspects of, you know, someone really needs to take a careful look at it. But I haven't got a straight answer, a straight answer on whether there is a policy that solves the split incentive problem. Um, I've asked this question, um, but yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you might need a more photogenic person for that, but I'll be happy to. <laughs> I'll be happy to. Yeah.
Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. You had your hand up first, and then I'll come to you. Right. You know, and they have a roof that uh, you know, all of that stuff. Now, how ugly can some of these buildings are going to be? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, look, in terms of ugliness, I've seen some designs, and this came from, I was in Denmark this summer for a climate change conference, and I saw a design which people said, what the heck is that? We can't, I'm not going to live in that. But you're right. I mean, that's, 